This is a thrilling, scary, and deeply strange time to be alive. On the border of Europe, we've got a war that's killed hundreds of thousands of people, and it shows no sign of reaching an end anytime soon. And the most powerful states in the world are lining up against each other and seemingly preparing for a wider conflict. At the same time, a new technology, AI, has appeared whose promise is unclear. Will it grant us a world of post-scarcity, as the techno-optimists claim? Is it going to kill us all, as the AI doomers claim? Or does it promise something much more insidious? The possibility to construct a kind of digital panopticon, one that exalts a kind of deadening rationality and allows power to monitor and ultimately control every aspect of our lives. Now, if that wasn't enough, we're also seeing dramatic shifts in the official treatment of the UFO phenomenon. A long-term campaign of denial and disinformation and ridicule aimed at covering up the existence of UFOs and what the US government knows about them appears to be ending, or at least changing into something new. The US military is now telling us that yes, UFOs exist, but it's claiming that it doesn't know what they are. Many people who've studied this phenomenon know that it's intimately connected to questions of spirit and consciousness. Others are more focused on the implications of humans getting their hands on so-called alien technology. But as Arthur C. Clarke said, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. But we might also ask, what spells are the technologies we already possess casting on our souls and how are they molding our collective consciousness? Taken together, you'd be more than reasonable to suspect that we're on the cusp of profound changes in the world. Are we about to enter a capital N, capital A new age? And if so, what will its character be? This is the first in a series of videos in which I'm gonna argue that it's no coincidence that all of the phenomena I've mentioned are happening at the same time. You can think of this series as a kind of companion to the series on the astrology of the 2020s that I made last year with SJ Anderson. What I'm going to present here will build on the ideas from that series, but also take them in some new directions. Now, in that series, we saw how there are two incredibly consequential astrological alignments taking place in the year 2026. The first, happening in February of that year, is a conjunction of Saturn and Neptune at zero degrees of Aries the first degree of the entire tropical zodiac. And the second is the geometrically stunning alignment of Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto, known as a minor grand trine, in which all three planets are in flowing aspects with each other. In the middle of July that year, Pluto will be at four Aquarius, Uranus will be at four Gemini, and Neptune will be at four Aries. And the addition of Jupiter at four Leo will form this remarkable configuration that SJ calls the basket. So in this series, I'm gonna try and shed more light on what this astrology and the history that lies behind it is telling us about where our world is heading. And I should probably warn you that this journey, if it's not already obvious, is not gonna be for the faint of heart, but neither is life itself. So if you wanna join me on what I promise will be a wild journey through the past, the present, and the future, get yourself a stiff drink or a green tea, whatever your poison is, and let's get going. Now, before we get to the really out there stuff, we are gonna have to eat some historical and astrological vegetables, because we're gonna need this foundation to understand the things we'll be seeing later on in the series. And we're gonna start by thinking about the idea of astrological ages. Astrologers, including yours truly, are always talking about new eras and epochs and ages. For example, I've talked a lot about the age of air on this channel, and I've talked about Pluto in Aquarius, and Neptune in Pisces, and any number of other astrologically defined periods of time that have characters of their own. And you could be forgiven for sensing something of the boy who cried wolf with all these new ages. I want to make a plea in the defense of astrology here, because the reason that astrologers are always making this kind of claim is really just down to the nature of astrology and, by extension, time itself. What astrology shows us is that the changing manifestation of reality over time happens according to multiple cycles, 
all piled on top of each other at the same time. And these cycles aren't necessarily synchronized. They don't necessarily begin or end at the same time, and they last different amounts of time. So we really have a problem of language here. Whenever a new cycle begins, or a planet enters a new sign, or a timing technique indicates a shift, we can say with some justification that we've entered a new era, or epoch, or age. Whether you're doing world astrology, or looking at an individual chart, what a good astrologer does is examine multiple techniques and cycles overlaid on top of each other, and then synthesizes them to understand what's happening at any given moment in time. It's impossible to do that even close to perfectly because we're mere humans, but we try. Now, one of the best known long divisions of time that astrologers and Wu types in general like to talk about is the age of Aquarius. This is the dawn. This isn't an idea I've talked about on this channel much before, and I need to stress, because this seems to sometimes confuse people, that it's not the same thing as the Age of Air, which has to do with conjunctions of Jupiter and Saturn. We'll be talking about that in a later episode of this series. The Age of Aquarius is really a new age idea, dating to the late 19th century, that has to do with the phenomenon of the precession of the equinoxes. Precession is a very well-known concept in astronomy and astrology. Essentially, as the Earth rotates around the Sun, the Earth wobbles slightly, like a spinning top. And what this means is that the point of the sky that's rising at the time of the spring equinox every year is gradually shifting by about one degree every 72 years. The sidereal sign of Pisces is rising at the spring equinox right now, but at some point in the future, the sign of Aquarius will be rising, heralding the so-called Age of Aquarius. At least this is one of many definitions of the Age of Aquarius. The reality is that nobody can really agree on when it begins. Some say it began hundreds of years ago. Some say it's beginning around now. Others say it won't be here for a few hundred years. We're going to come back to this idea in a later episode too, because it's actually very relevant to the theme of this series, but it's not the timing technique that I'm going to be using in these videos. So here's the plot twist. We may or may not be in the age of Aquarius, but what we do know is that according to another extremely important cycle, we are in fact in the age of Gemini. And the cycle that tells us that is the synodic cycle of Pluto and Neptune. I'd argue that this cycle is the deepest and most fundamentally powerful synodic cycle in mundane astrology. And unlike the Age of Aquarius, we know pretty much exactly where in the tropical zodiac that these conjunctions have taken place. There's no room for argument. Now, if you're enjoying this content so far, please do be a good egg and click that like button. And also subscribe so you don't miss the rest of this series, which I promise is going to be mental in a good way. Pluto-Neptune conjunctions happen roughly every 492 years, making this the slowest synodic cycle using the major bodies in mundane astrology. Remember, a synodic cycle is just a cycle that forms from the relative movement of two bodies around the ecliptic from the perspective of Earth. Now, the best known of them is the lunar cycle, in which the Moon changes from new Moon to full Moon and back again every 29 and a half days. But what is the Pluto-Neptune cycle all about? In Pluto, we have the Greek Hades, the god of the underworld. Pluto speaks to great eruptions of power from invisible realms. We could think of Pluto as like a volcano. It may warn us with rumblings, but generally we can't perceive what's going on until it erupts with huge transformative power. Volcanoes wreak great destruction, yet they also create new land and generate the most fertile soils. Broadly speaking, Pluto in astrology has to do with themes of power and transformation through the process of death and rebirth. And in Neptune, we have the Greek Poseidon, the god of the sea. Neptune's meaning encompasses all those things that we can conceive of as oceanic, consciousness, connectedness, and the dissolution of boundaries. Neptune speaks to the realms of the imagination and of the numinous and of spirit and faith. And the cycle of these two planets together speaks to transformations of human belief and consciousness over time. 
of great shifts in our most fundamental assumptions about how we should live and how the world works. It's almost as if Neptune signifies faith and belief, but it needs the sheer force and power of Pluto to drive change on Earth. And there's something very interesting about the way this Pluto-Neptune cycle moves around the great wheel of the zodiac. Because the successive conjunctions of Pluto and Neptune, which come every half a millennium, creep forward through the zodiac sign by sign. We see multiple conjunctions in Aries, then the conjunctions move to the next sign, Taurus, where we see several more. Then they move to the next sign, Gemini, and so forth. So this provides us with a kind of meta-cycle, another layer of great ages. An age of Aries, an age of Taurus, an age of Gemini, and so on. The zodiac can be seen as a wheel showing the great cycle of life from the primordial split and our emergence into the world represented by the sign of Aries to our eventual return to source from which we emerged represented by Pisces. We act out the various roles represented by the signs over the course of our individual lives. But the Pluto-Neptune cycle shows how the collective consciousness of humanity itself makes this same journey over the course of thousands of years. Needless to say, this is a hugely complex topic because we're talking about the shifting collective consciousness of humanity over time. So now we're going to indulge in a very, very brief history of human belief from the ancient world to the present day. And we're going to start by looking at the Age of Aries. The first Pluto-Neptune conjunction in Aries happened in 2561 BC. Because of the way Pluto and Neptune move around the zodiac relative to Earth, sometimes they'll make three conjunctions, or sometimes just one, before they separate and make their own ways around the zodiac. So there was a set of conjunctions in Aries around 2561 BC, then another set around 2065 BC, and then a third and final set around 1569 BC. So the age of Aries lasted about 1500 years until the conjunctions moved to Taurus in 1073 BC. So we have a span for the age of Aries of very roughly 2500 BC to 1000 BC. And this span of time lines up pretty well with what historians refer to as the Bronze Age, a period of time when people moved from using stone tools to bronze tools, made by melting tin and copper. But remember, with Pluto-Neptune, we're talking about deep questions of belief and consciousness and faith here. Can we make any generalizations about spiritual tradition during the Bronze Age? Well, we can certainly try. And to do that, we're going to refer to the author Karen Armstrong's book, The Great Transformation, which charts the evolution in belief of four different peoples from the Bronze Age and into the first millennium BC. Now, the peoples Armstrong focuses on are the Chinese, the Indians, the Israelites, and the Greeks. And she paints vivid pictures of these societies as they were towards the end of the Age of Aries. Bear in mind that the sign of Aries is ruled in astrology by Mars, the god of war. Now, one theme that emerges is the important role that kings and chieftains played in the rites and rituals of these societies as not only political, but also spiritual leaders. And another element that's common to all of them is the importance of blood sacrifice. For example, the Shang Dynasty ruled China from 1600 to 1046 BC. Armstrong describes Shang society as a strange mixture of refinement, sophistication, and barbarity. She says that their art was sophisticated and inventive. They created wonderfully inventive urns in the shape of sheep, rhinoceroses or owls, but they were not squeamish about slaughtering the beasts they observed so tenderly, sometimes slaying as many as a hundred victims in a single sacrifice. Animals weren't the only sacrifices made by the Shang. Funerals of Shang royalty would be accompanied by the ritual murder of tens or even hundreds of servants and retainers. And here's what Armstrong says of the warlike Aryan people who settled in India around 1500 BC. They loved their war chariots and powerful bronze swords. They were cowboys who earned their living by stealing their neighbors' livestock. Because their lives depended on cattle rustling, it was more than a sport. It was also a sacred activity with rituals that gave it an infusion of divine power. The Indian Aryans wanted a dynamic religion. Their heroes were the trekking warrior 
and the chariot fighter. Remember, this is a time when we would expect martial virtues to hold sway over questions of spirit and human consciousness. The Aryans had a heroic code in which enlightenment was inseparable from violent death. And in the land of Canaan, the home of the Israelites, in the late Bronze Age, it was very common to worship the god Baal, who Armstrong describes as a divine warrior who rode on the clouds of heaven in his chariot, fought battles with other gods, and brought the life-giving rains. We could continue for hours just on this complex subject alone, but the main message is that when Pluto-Neptune conjunctions were happening in Aries, human belief and ritual and consciousness in all these disparate places fell under an unmistakable martial influence. In 1073 BC, our Pluto-Neptune conjunctions moved to the sign of Taurus, a sign ruled by the planet Venus. And this period saw the rise of increasingly urban trading civilizations. And around the middle of the first millennium BC, something quite incredible happened. In many disparate corners of the world, within a period of only about 100 years, we saw the emergence of prophets and thinkers who changed the world and remain legendary thinkers to this day. For example, Confucius and Lao Tzu appeared in China, India produced the Buddha and the Upanishads, some of the key texts documenting the emergence of Hinduism were written down. And in Israel, the later Hebrew prophets appeared, and much of the Hebrew Bible was assembled. And in Greece, the first philosophers began to appear. All of these figures introduced new ideas about how to live in the world, and particularly the kind of guidelines that would allow human beings to live together relatively peacefully in large urban settlements. And their ideas continue to guide billions of people to this very day. And the German philosopher Karl Jaspers named this period the Axial Age, and it's really the idea around which Karen Armstrong's book, The Great Transformation, is built. So as we've seen, we saw all these towering figures appearing in the middle of the first millennium, and it turns out that they all appeared really close to the time of the second conjunction of Pluto and Neptune in Taurus, in 578 BC. Let's have a look at that conjunction because there was something unusual about it. Here's the conjunction itself at 9 degrees and 10 minutes of Taurus. Let's see what else was going on with that conjunction. Yes, there just a few degrees away is Uranus. So this was really a triple conjunction of the three outer planets. And you can see how over the course of the next couple of years, all three of them were within a degree or two of each other. There hasn't been another of these extremely rare triple conjunctions since that time, and there hasn't been another time to rival the Axial Age. Now, if you ask your average historian why so many of the world's great thinkers and faiths emerged across the world at almost precisely the same time, without any real contact with each other, they'll probably just shrug and say it's just an intriguing coincidence. In other words, they've got nothing. Because very few of them allow themselves the benefit of the one tool we have for understanding why particular moments in time have particular qualities. It begins with an A, and it's not anthropology, archaeology, or astronomy. But I digress. And there are some other interesting commonalities among the faiths that emerged during the age of Taurus, which lasted until the year 1398, so almost 2,500 years in total. For one thing, Venus is the planet traditionally associated with the priesthood. You can find this in Vettius Valens from the second century. Temples are usually places of cleanliness and beauty, things ruled by Venus. And in general, the religions that arose during the age of Taurus relied on mediators who interpreted the will of the gods for the people, priests, rabbis, oracles, imams, and so on. And another thing to bear in mind is that Venus's essential nature is to unify. It's why she symbolizes sex, as well as balance, harmony, and aesthetics. And what else did we see during this period? Well, we saw the rise of the great monotheistic religions. Judaism became monotheistic, and many other monotheistic faiths followed on from it. So there's a sense of the polytheistic gods of the ancient world being drawn together into one, as if in a Venusian process of unification. So the triple conjunction of Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto at the time of the Axial Age is for me one of the most compelling pieces of evidence we have for mundane astrology's effectiveness. But the Pluto-Neptune cycle gives us another one, and that has to do with the shift of these conjunctions from the sign of Taurus 
into the sign of Gemini. In the next episode, we're going to examine the age of Gemini, which began with those Pluto-Neptune conjunctions in 1398 and 1399. And we're going to see how that period was a real watermark in the history of Europe and ultimately of the whole world. If you made it this far, thank you so much. I'd just like to take the opportunity to let you know that I'm available for private natal consultations where I'm focused on helping people to situate themselves in time, find purpose and calling in the world, and navigate these very strange times. And I'm also available for electional consultations where I will find you the best possible moment in time to initiate that important project that means everything to you whatever it may be, so long as it's not evil, of course. Find the details in the description below. Now, if you didn't watch the series of videos I made with SJ Anderson on the astrology of the 2020s last year, then I suggest you do that now because this series will make a lot more sense once you've done that. And you can start with this episode in which we examined the amazing astrology of 2026 and the work of Andre Barbeau, the legendary French astrologer who predicted the 2020 pandemic. See you next time.